All right, welcome everyone to the February 2023 Collaboration Cafe webinar uh, sponsored by the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub with support from the National Science Foundation. I'm John McMullen, Executive Director of the Midwest Hub, and today we'll be exploring the NIH's program to support research experience in genomics for data scientists. Uh, we have two guests today to help us talk through that solicitation, so I'm very happy to welcome uh, two program directors at NIH, uh, both of whom are in the National Human Genome Research Institute, or the NHGRI. Uh, we have Dr. Asandhya Shira Sagar, uh, who's in the Office of Genomic Data Science, and Lucia Hindorf, uh, who's in the Training, Diversity, and Health Equity Office. Um, so thank you both for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I am going to uh, put the link to our slides for today into uh, the chat for folks. Uh, those are available on our website. Uh, so if you are wanting to look through the content that we present today, uh, you can find those there. Uh, and if you're watching the recording, you'll find those on our website as well. All right, so the plan for today is to talk through the uh, solicitation uh, of, of interest for this month. Um, uh, we have a, a short presentation from our NIH guests uh, and then we'll get into a little bit more detail of, of some of the uh, elements of the, the FOA that they have. Um, but I want to spend most of the time in discussion to answer audience questions and, and talk a little bit more about uh, genomics and data science in the Midwest uh, with our audience. So um, let's go ahead and get into that. I want to just give a quick overview to uh, who we are and, and what we do uh, for those of you who may be joining for the first time. Uh, this is a monthly series that we run uh, out of the Midwest Hub here. Uh, we're part of a national network of four hubs funded by NSF, um, and all four of us are focused on building communities and collaborations around data science uh, in various uh, manifestations. And so if you're attending today or watching the video from outside the Midwest, there is another hub uh, somewhere nearby you that you should uh, explore and, and see what uh, might be uh, in alignment with the work that you do. Um, here in the Midwest, this is a partnership of six universities uh, led by us here at the University of Illinois uh, in Urbana-Champaign. Um, and we focus on a number of priority areas and cross-cutting themes that are uh, really key to the Midwest region. Um, today in particular, we'll be focused on uh, big data and health uh, in, in alignment with our data science education and workforce development uh, cross-cutting theme. Um, and then, as I said, this is a, an ongoing series that we have um, that really uh, came from community interest in having a, a neutral venue for discussion of new collaborations around data science uh, partnerships and, and responding to large scale proposal opportunities. So this is a, a venue where we talk about uh, new opportunities and, and think about uh, new collaborations to respond to those opportunities. Um, we have a number of resources beyond the, the live webinar that we do. Uh, we have uh, each of these uh, sessions recorded on our YouTube uh, playlist that you can check out after the, the meeting. Uh, we do have a Slack community uh, to continue the discussion. Um, and we have a, a number of different documents, including uh, prior awards of each of the programs that we talk about so that people can explore uh, in more detail what has been funded in a particular area. We do encourage people to reach out with topics or solicitations they'd like to see us discuss in the future. So we're happy to have your input about what would be uh, relevant and, and interesting uh, to hear about on this call uh, in the future. Um, we, uh, as an organization, engage in different ways with folks on proposals. Uh, in, in many cases, we can provide a letter of collaboration uh, to help you amplify the work that you're doing. Uh, but we also develop our own proposals and, and partner with people on 
new initiatives. And so we're happy to talk with you uh, in, in whatever way would be helpful to uh, engage in the work that you do. Um, so I'm going to stop here uh, briefly, and we'll come back to the, the details that I have about this program. But I want to turn it over to uh, Sandhya to talk uh, through the slides that you have uh, to begin and give us a little sense of what the goals of this program are for NIH and NHGRI, um, and in particular, you know, how the, uh, the need for a more diverse workforce uh, in genomics and data science uh, is being addressed by this program. Thank you, and I'm happy to be here today. And I really appreciate learning about this hub. Uh, I did not know of this hub, so it's I'm happy. So uh, I'm just curious before I go into the presentation, is this part of like the cybers or is that a completely different um, infrastructure? Yeah, that's a completely different program from NSF, but uh, yeah, I think there are some similarities between them uh, that that may be more of a, a gateway uh, kind of project where we're more of a uh, human networking uh, collaboration kind of project. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, so I am going to share my screen. And before I go into the slide deck itself, I just want to share a little bit about the vision of our institute, um, because this is a question that comes up about, um, you know, what is our focus compared to some of the focus of the other institutes? And so our institute, in some ways, is a little di disease di agnostic. And, and what I mean by that is our mission is to advance genomics research and, you know, trans in, and how do we use it to transform our understanding of human health and disease? Um, and many of the programs that we initiatives that we have um, are designed to allow genomics, use of genomics in a more wide way than disease focused way. Um, so cancer, for example, looks at a lot of things in cancer specific way. They also do genomics, but of course in a more genomic way. Um, but more of the methods and, and, and resources that are developed within the NHGRI's initiatives are more uh, focused to allow um, sort of broad application to businesses. So that's, and, and also our focus is human gene as opposed to the metagene uh, or the microbiome, microbiome genome research. Um, so with that, um, I'd just like to point out a few links that also are in the, the presentation that I'm going to share a PDF for. A PDF for. Uh, but this is uh, is a link to the funding opportunities and all the different opportunities that we have. Um, and then my colleague Lucia, um, she I'll let her introduce herself too. So um, this is the training diversity and health equity office, and she's very she's part of this office, and she's very um, you know she can answer questions related to diversity. And there are a lot of programs that we have to increase the diversity and health equity. And then the other thing, of course, is the COVID stuff. Um, so, Lucia, do you want to say a few words before I start? Yes, hi, thank you. So uh, my name is Lucia Hendorf. I'm the extramural lead for training based out of the Training Diversity and Health Equity Office. And I think that um, you know, San Sanjay has uh, covered the basic um, program announcement that um, is of primary interest to us, but I wanted to note that we are interested in training a broad range of career stages. And so this particular one is for individuals who are master's students, but we also have training programs from high school all the way up until established investigators. And so we're really thinking across the career stages um, and what the needs are for bringing people into genomics and for people who are already into genomics to help support them from one career stage to the next. So yeah, really happy to be here, happy to answer questions about training more broadly in addition to the questions about the specific PAR that Sandhya talked about. So let me begin then with the... Um, this, this, um, Mm -hmm. a second. All right. Okay. Um, and so, as we said, my name is Sandhya and Kirsagar and colleague is Lucia Hindor. Um, and so, um, really, uh, 
one of the major goals of this PAR uh, is, is to diversify the genomics workers. That is our principal goal. So we want to be able to attract new data science talent to genomics research because we all know that data science is really key nowadays um, to, to doing what we do better, right? Um, and so the goal is then to recruit new data science talent for genomics research. Um, and so we want to encourage groups that are underrepresented in biomedical and behavioral sciences. And I will have a short depiction of this so that I'll go over that. Um, and then the other thing that Lucia mentioned really is to start at earlier stages than doctor and students, right? You want to you want to be able to encourage them to learn about genomics before they actually become doctoral students, where they may actually focus on specific areas like chemistry or you know uh, geology or, or there are other course um, uh, areas. Um, and and the, the goal is also to in um, recruit individuals from diverse backgrounds, um, including underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. And so this goes very well with, with your groups uh, in the vision with the hubs that you have um, and individuals with disabilities and women, you know, we always encourage uh, to apply. And um, we hope that we will see more uh, diversity in this workforce. Um, so really, um, as I mentioned, uh, the goal of this was to uh, support creative educational activities with a primary focus on research experiences for students. And this is kind of key and which is why I've highlighted it and I will repeat it maybe because it, it is a very sometimes confusing the all of the different kind of issues that there. These are for currently students who are currently enrolled in master's degree programs in data science. And then attract them to genomics. So if you look at the schema here, um, and then uh, you're looking at data science programs, people who are, or the students who are enrolled in data science programs. So for example, what we mean by that is master's degree in statistics, mathematics, computer science, or any quantitative or analytical fields without any existing genomics or biological component. And the goal is to bring those data scientists into the genomic programs. Um, and once again, the the, the Goal here is that they should not have had genomics experience because the whole goal is to introduce genomics to them and and have them really uh, we hope run uh, that they will love it so much that they will run to this and stick stay there um, so that's the principal goal um, and so I wanted to provide a little bit more of the scope because sometimes you know um, and as I mentioned uh, that is this is for current master's degree data science students. Um, and so what I wanted to focus a little bit on this slide is, you know, what are not, um, what are not, you know, you know, which groups are not responsive uh, to this uh, announcement, right? So who we cannot support. Um, data scientists who have completed an undergraduate degree but are not enrolled in data science and master's degree. So enrollment in the master's degree is a key. And then data science, scientists who have extensive genomics research experience. Uh, and then master's degree students currently enrolled in genomics program who are gaining, interested in gaining exposure to data science. So this is going the other way. If you look at the previous diagram. And then um, summer only programs. Um, and so what I want to do in the next slide, I, you know, a little bit to go to what Lucia, Lucia was saying, um, is that we have other programs among which this is one of the programs, right? So we have several programs that, different programs that are geared, for example, to career transitions. So for example, students going from uh, uh, pre-doctoral to post-doctoral, uh, pre-doctoral to doctoral, or post-doctoral to post-doctoral, or, um, or rather post-doctoral to um, um, researchers, like assistant, uh, you know, staff, uh, academic uh, PIs, researchers. And then, uh, you know, there's loan reclaim and there's fellowships. There's different career development and educational activities. Uh, there are, uh, for example, I think Lucia, to this year, uh, it was in January, I believe that it was, there was a summer ice spring, which was, which was a summer ex um, immersion experience that was there. Um, 
and then there is institutional training, courses and curricular modules, there's mentored research experiences. Uh, so really, there is a whole host of different types of experiences. And Lucia, I don't know if you want to say a little more on this slide. I know this is your slide that you have helped with. No, I think that provides a pretty good general overview of the kinds of things that we fund. Um, I'm happy to answer specific questions after you um, present the other slides. Yeah, no, I'm good. This is really what we have. So, yeah, um, I don't. So, happy to take any questions or if you want to elaborate on that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, we will get into some more details of the the uh funding opportunity in a moment here but are there any questions from the audience at this point that you have for our guests i do have a question um just regarding the eligibility um you mentioned that you must be enrolled in a master's program um however i do believe there some programs exist that essentially are from the start phd programs um and they don't award master's degree. I, I assume someone who's just starting out, you know, hasn't attained a bachelor's degree yet would be eligible um, if they were working toward a PhD in a program that does not award master's. So this is specifically for master's. There are probably other programs, but this one is aimed at you have to be in a master's program or in the data science field. And I would say coming at it from a, a, a bit of a, a, maybe another angle is this is an institutional award. So this is a program that someone will develop to um, aid master students in discovering genomics. And so, you know, we're not talking necessarily the level of an individual. And so an institution that would apply would need to, you know, um, set the program up such that you know, like a PhD program whose students are already studying genomics, that wouldn't really qualify because we're trying to attract people from these other disciplines and bring them to genomics. So there's a bit of a sort of, you know, what's the angle of the program and how is it situated within existing programs of the institution or of the department or whoever is applying? Right. I mean, I wasn't thinking of someone who is in genomics already. I was saying, you know, maybe like a bioengineering, biostatistics type program, um, but that just essentially offers bachelor's and PhD degrees. <laughs> um, so those are good thoughts. And I think Lucia, I don't know if you have more thoughts on that, but there are other um, ways I think that um, so PIs can, you know, PIs apply for our own grants. So, and usually these people are on a research project. Okay. Um, so this program, um, and, and maybe we'll get into that in our sure. But so one thing that I wanted to specify is this program specifically allows for funding a portion of the hours uh, that that person is enrolled in as a whole, right? And so it focuses on producing, providing support for just that portion that they would be doing this kind of genomics type of activities, right? Um, it's not for that entire um, you know, program. The tuition is there, but the other support is is more geared towards just specifying. Unless it's in summer, I think it's full time because if you're working full time on a genomics project, then they will fund for that. Or they'll support you for that. So I don't know if that helps. So. Um, I have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, discussing this, and thank you, Zon, for inviting me. Uh, we here at Michigan Tech have a master's in data science program. So, uh, I mean, I think a program like this would fit for uh, this one, right? If you're planning on introducing courses uh, on genomics, right? Be able to take those, yes. I mean, so, what about the. And I can't spe speak to specific grants, sure. but it seems like it would fit, is what I would say. Uh, Lucia, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, if you read the um the eligibility information, um, the the description under the FOA, it sounds like it would broadly fit. I mean, I do think there's an aspect of this where if it's you know if it's already a data science program in genomics that that you know may or may not qualify. I think we'd want to talk to you a little bit more, um, one on one. But in general, I think you know mass, um, data science um, master's degree programs is is the intended audience for this. Sure. So thank you. One more question. Uh, most of our students are international students. Are there any 
requirements in terms of, uh, you know, uh, whether international students are eligible to get support from this program? I don't believe so. Uh, see, do you know about that? I don't think there's a requirement here uh, for that. Um, Sorry, can you repeat the question? So most... foreign students can apply for this. A foreign student. So again, this is an so institution. Yeah, they're if they're enrolled. They're not citizens of this country or they're not permanent residents. I right. believe I believe there's language in the FOA. We would need to look it up. I think it's an it there, you know, it's it's kind of a soft requirement. It says it's intended for the education of US citizens US citizens. I, I I'm I'm um not remembering the exact language, but there is a little bit of language in there about about international students. So um we may want to find that um and share it. It's, it's it should be in the program announcement. Sure. Um, thank you. And one more question. So, uh, again, when like you know, for funded proposals, are these proposals mostly coming from one institutions, or are these more of a collaborative proposals? What have you seen so far? So, I what I would say is you have to do what is helpful for your institution. I think. Sure. And also the goal is to encourage diversity, right? Um, so I think, you know, with that in mind, it depends on how you want to set this up. Mm -hmm. But it's also a limited amount. So, you know, you may want to think about the costs involved also in multiple places. But, you know, if you have established collaborations and if you have, so for example, I can think of a reason where, where now let's suppose you have your institution, the students are in your uh, institution, but then you want them to be able to go do research in summer in an institution that's close by. Um, mm -hmm. it's not too far off because then, you know, it becomes a public cost. Um, so if it's feasible, then you can, I think. Um, there's nothing that prevents you from doing that. Sure, so thank you. I, I will let Lucia answer because she has a lot more, I think, sometimes experience than no, I, I, I think I think that was fine, Sanjay. I mean, I, I think we usually do recommend that people come talk to us um, when you have an idea for a program that might fit this, and then we can talk to you about, um, you know, how it it may or may not fit within the mission of the NHGRI. If there's a different opportunity that might fit, um, but yeah, I, th I think that that's what I would suggest. Sure. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and, and give us a little more detail on the uh, the program itself, and that may answer other questions that folks have. All right. Hopefully you can see my screen again. Um, so just a couple of quick notes here. Uh, I did put the link to the announcement uh, into the chat for folks if you'd like to uh, check that out if you haven't seen that already. Um, this is an annual program, uh, or it has been the past couple of years, and so proposals are due uh, May 25th of this year. Um, I don't know uh, if that program is intended to continue uh, into the future or not, whether you can say anything about that today, but um, it has been in, in place for the past couple of years. Yeah, it is definitely under consideration, and we are having conversations internally, but um, we don't have any specifics. Yeah, no, I, I understand. And, Until the announcement comes out, it's it's uh, not something that you can confirm at this point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I have the, the program goals in here from the solicitation, and I, I think uh, we've covered some of these already. Uh, but in terms of the, the size and scope, uh, you know, this is a, a program that's up to five years in duration and up to 250,000 a year uh, total costs. Um, uh, and, and there's a maximum budget for the overall project. And so we'll get into in a minute here what, what that might look like. Um, but that that is something that could be important uh, if you're looking at a, a collaborative award. It's not a huge amount of funding. And so thinking about specifically what those costs might be if you're having multiple partners involved here is something to consider. Um, Lucia, I see you have your hand up. Yep, I just wanted to clarify because I I'm not sure if I heard correctly. the The budget is 250k direct costs. Um, it's a direct cost limit. But um, for those of you who 
live in this land of NIH speak, we do have an 8% um, cap on indirect cost rate. So for our 25s, it's a little bit of a different indirect cost, but the the limit in the um, in the PAR is 250 direct. Great. Thanks for clarifying that because I thought that that included the direct, the indirects. And so that that's helpful to know. Um, all right. I then something in the sorry. chat, just let you know, I pasted something in the chat uh, about the previous question that you had with regard to U.S. citizens versus and permanent residents versus not. So unless strongly justified on the basis of exceptional relevance to NIH research education program should be used primarily for education of U.S. citizens and permanent residents. Sure, thank you. All right. Um, all right, so for this particular program, there is not a requirement for a letter of intent, um, but there is some encouragement in the solicitation to reach out to NIH um, to uh, review your, your plans and, and talk about uh, uh, the fact that you're intending to propose, just so that they have some sense of how many people are uh, intending to propose to the program, and that is a 30-day uh, minimum window that you need to submit that uh, if you do that. Um, so we had talked a little about the eligibility of the student participants. There is some eligibility for the proposer as well. And so you need to be an established uh, researcher or faculty member at, at a particular uh, type of institution in order to propose to this program. Um, and, you know, there is an expectation that, that the institution has some existing experience with uh, NIH funding. And um, so I did want to, to probe on that a little bit. You know, we do have institutions in our region that um, really don't have a lot of historical funding from NIH, but may be very interested in a program like this to help their um, students get more experience in NIH uh, areas like genomics. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little about um, you know that the the decision making around that eligibility issue. Um, Sandy, did you want me to take that one? I can, I can take, I can. Yeah, sorry, you are on mute. I couldn't tell if you were trying to speak. Um, so oh, what? I, yeah, what I would say. So this specific language is for the PD or PI, and I think the reason for that is that. The goal is to attract individuals to genomic research, and so there needs to be some sort of experience on behalf of the PI to understand what those needs are. Um, that being said, I think the program itself can and you know probably should be designed to take advantage of a large range of expertise, including people in you know kind of some of these adjacent fields. And so, when you're thinking about setting up the program, the faculty who are involved as mentors or instructors obviously can be distributed across other areas that might not be as genomics focused. Yeah, but sorry, do you have anything to add? Yeah, but the, the main thing is we have you have to have somebody who's experienced in genomics, right? To mm -hmm. be able to teach them genomics, to be able to mentor them in genomics research, because especially because this is sort of a first experience for them, um, in order for them to really understand genomics and even consider it for a career, we would think that, you know, the, the trainers have to have that experience. So mm -hmm. this is where I think in response to, you know, um, you, Duka, your um, comment, uh, it's, it's helpful to collaborate with other institutions that may have that expertise. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, what I would say. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, a collaboration here might look like uh, a data science faculty member and a genomics faculty member, you know, collaborating on the proposal so that they can both, uh, you know, uh, engage with their students. So uh, that to me makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, and then, you know, you're both here from NHGRI, but we have seen uh, other NIH solicitations where uh, proposers have to align with a particular institute. Um, you know, if they're doing cancer research, they have to reach out to NCI and, and talk about alignment there. Is, is there. is there that kind of uh, restriction with this opportunity, or is it is it more open than that? So this is... Uh, the way that I look at it, this is not a full-term project. 
And this is in uh, trying to help these students who have no experience at all in genomics to understand genomics and to kind of get their hands their feet wet a little bit in our working on genomics project. So we understand that it would have, I mean, you know, that the summer research project will likely have to be in a specific field uh, and not on, you know, it, it won't be a really broad project. But the goal is that they learn enough techniques in genomics that they can then apply it anywhere broadly. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and that can be gained on a specific uh, disease focus. Um, but, and, and the reason that in this particular case it works is because it's a small program. I mean, it's a small exposure program. And so, yeah, I would say, you know, a, a limited exposure. So, um, and Lucia, do you have anything to comment on? I, no, I, I think that was good. I mean, I, again, I guess I would just say a lot of times what helps us um, is people who are interested in applying for this, if they sort of, you know, write up a draft of their specific aims and then run it by us, then we can sort of, you know, communicate what about it looks like it might fit. If it's, you know, if it's too specialized, probably not, but that's a hard thing to communicate, you know, without seeing what the ideas are. So sorry, that's kind of a non-answer, but we are always happy to talk with people about their ideas and, and make recommendations, so. Yeah, I, mean, no. I think the goal is for them to get a broad genomic space. Like mm -hmm. it would be hard if they came back maybe. I'm just thinking they just said, oh, they're just going to be studying one one subject, like um, you know, Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. There's just one topic that they're going to study. But if, if they're going to get that broad background and then focus in for their research project on something, that's different, I think. Very good. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the key thing that I took away from uh, especially what Lucia was saying was that you're open to having those early stage discussions with proposers to understand what the what the fit looks like. And I, I think a lot of times, especially early career faculty um, may not be aware that that is an opportunity. They may see the solicitation and and uh, and figure that they just have to respond to what's there uh, without really talking to uh, a program director. And, and so, you know, we definitely want to encourage them to reach out if they have ideas and want to understand whether those are appropriate. Right. And what I also want to say is many early career um, researchers also have uh, mentors um, mm -hmm. that can mentor them uh, because, you know, training is, is not something that, you know, in, um, it, it is helpful to have somebody who is experienced to guide you through some of these things, right? So I think, um, yeah, so that's what I would say is, yeah, so it is helpful to be able to look at your um, goals. Very good. So looking at some more of these details, um, I think that, that some of these were addressed in the earlier slides. Um, but just highlighting again, this is for master students only, uh, and it's not a, an institutional uh, training grant like some of the other NIH programs. And so this is not for full-time support for trainees. Uh, this is um, a fraction of their time during the academic year and, and potentially in the summer as well. Um, there is some support for uh, participant costs for various things. Um, but there are some limitations as well on personnel, you know, so administrative costs around the program. Uh, the indirects are limited to a, a much smaller percentage than the typical negotiated rate. Um, and so being mindful of some of those as you start to put your budgets together, uh, if you propose to this program, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of detail on this in the FOA. And so making sure that you read through that uh, thoroughly is, is really important here. Um, okay, so let's talk a little more about what is what is included in a proposal to this program. Um, there is, there's some really nice detail in the solicitation about um, specifically what these elements include. Um, we won't cover all of these uh, right now, but uh, just looking at a couple of, of them here, um, you know, there there is specific detail about the program faculty, so who they are and what their expertise is in genomics, for example, um, what kind of participants you're um, intending to recruit to be the, the trainees for this program, 
um, what specific plan you have to recruit, you know, a, a diverse cohort of students, for example. So again, lots of different pieces here that you need to be mindful of, um, but there is quite a bit of detail in the solicitation to help you uh, understand that. Um, I wanted to, to highlight in particular the, the research experience plan for the trainees uh, and, and what exactly they are uh, covering in the program. Uh, this, this is a, a critical part of the solicitation and uh, of your proposal. And so, you know, uh, having a, a very complete and, and detailed description of what that training looks like uh, is really important here as well. Um, again, one of the things that jumps out to me is that this, this involves um, mentoring for trainees in addition to their, uh, you know, curriculum or coursework or whatever activities they're involved in. There, there's some uh, uh, mentoring tailored to those individual students as well. And so talking about how, how you're going to address that um, in the proposal is important too. Um, and then let's just talk quickly about the review criteria. So, you know, on this call, we have seen from multiple federal agencies some really nice detail in the solicitation about exactly what the reviewers will be looking at when they look at your proposal. Um, you know, that, that obviously is helpful to you as a, a writer of a proposal to know exactly what you're being measured against. And so um, in this particular program, we see some of the standard NIH uh, review criteria that have a score associated with them by the reviewers. Um, there's some solicitation specific criteria that may apply here uh, or may not, depending upon the content of your program. Um, and then there's some additional considerations um, that I think align with the, the interest in a diverse workforce. Uh, you know, what's your plan to recruit uh, participants? Um, how are you going to, uh, uh, you know, understand uh, the, the, the characteristics of the, the people that you're trying to support here? Um, all of those are taken into consideration by the review panel, uh, and so it's it's good to know that up front. Um, there's also some discussion of um, outcomes assessment after the project is finished. Um, uh, and so in the blue box here, you can see uh, some of that detail as well. So, you know, understanding again the the characteristics of the, the trainees and then you know what happens to them after your training program is done do they go on to get uh you know additional uh educational uh, programs do they get employed somewhere in a related field you know what are some of the ways that you're capturing uh the longer term outcomes of this program um, if you're familiar with the nsf broader impacts uh kinds of assessment uh, this to me looks similar to that in terms of how does this have a, a long-term impact on the, the field of data science and genomics uh, going forward? Um, I don't know if our guests would like to talk to any of the, the review criteria or the process in, in regard to this program, but we'd be happy to have any, any comments that you have. You know, uh, I'm happy. Go ahead, Lucia. Lucia, you're going to say something? Um, sure. Okay. So I was going to say you did a really nice job of covering the review criteria and basically said what I usually tell people, which is the review criteria are basically the instruction manual for peer reviewers. And so knowing that in advance really helps. Um, so just you know, reiterating, reiterating what you said, John, that's um, always really helpful for people to know in advance. Sandhya, go ahead. Sorry. Nick, you're on mute. Um. That was uh, also what I was going to say. They did a really good job. And I think, um, you know, you have the review criteria right next to some of these important, um, you know, things that reviewers look at, right? So looking at innovation uh, in, in all of these uh, plans that are going to be evaluated is, is, is a great thing, right? I mean, it's, it's, you really need to understand how... Um, you can improve on the way things are at this time. Um, so um, I think looking at the, those review criteria in terms of these 
some of these plans might be really helpful. But yeah, again, I think to um, Lucia's point, I think, you know, uh, with regard to the specific games, if once you, um, you know, have those, you'd be happy to review them for just not from the review criteria perspective, but just in terms of what you plan. Very good. Yeah, I mean, it, from a, a perspective of someone who writes proposals, it's always good to see this level of detail in the solicitation so that we know uh, exactly what we should be responding to. So that's very helpful. Um, so that is sort of my summary. Uh, at this point, um, we can get into questions about um, anything that has been brought up so far. Uh, I did want to highlight again that as a part of this series, we do try to capture awards that were made in the Midwest uh, for the particular programs that we look at. And so there's three here that we looked at uh, actually last year when we looked at this program. Um, and so you can get to that um, document from our website uh, and see other uh, awards that have been made uh, since then. Uh, I think most of those are outside of the Midwest, but again, could provide you some good examples of uh, programs that have already been funded uh, in uh, through this uh, announcement. Um, okay, and then uh, before we get into questions, I just wanted to mention that um, we do have a couple of sessions coming up over the next couple months here. Um, one uh, in March will be focused on the NSF uh, Research Coordination Networks program. So if you're interested in talking about building new uh, collaborations in the Midwest around data science. We'd like to have that conversation with you. Um, and then in April, we'll be focusing on uh, cyber infrastructure and the NSF size community research infrastructure program. So uh, thinking about use cases in the Midwest for new CI uh, tools and applications. Uh, if you're interested in either of those, we'd be happy to have you come back uh, for those uh, discussions. Um, Lucia, I see that you have your hand up. Go right ahead. I actually had a comment on the previous slide, so I don't know if you want to stop here and see if anyone else has questions about that slide. Okay, so um, I just wanted to point out, I believe these R25s are, some of them might be, maybe the first one is NHGR, but the others are probably not, I'm guessing based on just skimming them. So um, just so people know, the R25 is, is an activity code that covers a wide range of program announcements, at least at NHGRI. So, you know, again, we're always happy to talk with you to figure out if there's um, a particular one that fits your um, proposed program or research, but um, R25s are, are just kind of a very broad category of grants. Um, so just wanted to point that out. They're, they're listed under a number of different program announcements um, across institutes. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's helpful to know because um, I think when we had gone looking for awards, this program was still pretty young and had not made a lot uh, of, of awards at that point. And so some of these may be outside the scope of what would be awarded now, but are, are sort of in that alignment of bringing genomics uh, education to folks who don't have that in their uh, educational background. Um, we did have Jessica Fall on this call last year to talk about her program, uh, and that was very uh, helpful to hear about. And so uh, you could go back, uh, folks who are watching this could go back to the January 2022 uh, session that we had and, and hear more about uh, that program. Yeah, and I think on the website, um, it does specify, we were aware that um, these you know, are not necessarily all from this specific solicitation, but are are kind of related programs uh, involving data science and genomics through NIH. And so um, it, on the website, it does specify which solicitations those, those awards were made from. Okay, great. We did make our first awards last year for this program. I think there is one, there was one in the Midwest. So so that's something you could find in Reporter or mm -hmm. um, I don't remember if we have that up on our webpage anywhere. But it's yeah, it's it's a pretty new program. And so we're obviously still getting experience with it. But there's been a lot of interest in it. Yeah, I, I think we do have two listed from the Midwest that are specifically from this solicitation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. All right, so at this point, I want to open it up to uh, discussion and questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see each other uh, rather than just looking at slides here. Uh, but I'll put that list of questions that I just had up uh, in the chat for folks 
uh, just as as prompts to get us going here. But are there any questions that that you all have after hearing more details about the program? Is there anything that we can address while we're on the call with you? All right, well, feel free to to drop those in the chat uh, as they come up or unmute and, and ask them uh, to the group here. Um, but we have, I think, a mixture of folks uh, on the call um, uh, who are interested in this general topic area. And so I wanted to have a discussion uh, if folks are interested in what, what you may see as the current needs um, for this kind of program in, in the Midwest or beyond. Um, so Duca, I don't know if you if you want to talk through your uh, you know work uh, at Michigan Tech or, or other areas, but you know we're we're very interested in what folks are doing these days, where they may be headed in terms of developing new data science uh, plus uh, uh, genomics and bioinformatics and health kinds of areas. And so if if folks on the call would like to talk through ideas that you have or, or needs that you see in the the Midwest, we'd be happy to talk through that. Sure, maybe I can just add something. So I was a multi-PA in one of the T32, which is the Bridges to Doctorate program while I was at North Carolina a and State University. So uh, again, uh, that was, you know, kind of breezing master's students, you know, bringing in master's students at North Carolina a and and then putting them through that pipeline and then sending them to UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, so Again, I have some experience with this, but I, you know, I don't. I think that's the only NIS funding I have, and uh, it looks like that funding requirement probably puts a little bit of um, maybe barrier for somebody who wants to do this type of program. Uh, on the other hand, are there programs that are geared for like genomic scientists to teach data science? So this is to teach genomics for data scientists. But I was just curious if you have the program from the other end. So tell us a little bit more about who the intended audience is and maybe we can So the intended audience are people in you know MS in biology MS in biochemistry and things like that and so we just teach them you know data science because I mean you know department of computer science uh, so I was just you know trying to see if there's opportunity on that end Santa do you have thoughts on that in terms of training or where you sit in OGDS I am not aware of that. Um, I know that at the undergrad levels and in high preschool levels, I think there is some that SIPA, right? Uh, but I, I don't know. Right? Like, yeah, I mean, the programs that we support are, you know, obviously primarily about genomics and the you know the intersection of data data science and genomics. Um, I'm trying to think. Um. You know, it really depends on what area of data science, but NIGMS might support some of that or NIBIB, um, depending sure. on what, where exactly um, the the topics are, what topics are being covered. No, I mean, Mike, you know, so I had a question about the eligibility criteria. So I was thinking maybe just the MS student in our data science program might not be enough for this program. So I was thinking if, you know, there's somebody where we could, find these students in MS in biology or MS in biochemistry, put them as a cohort. And then, you know, so if we do that, maybe I was thinking, but again, you know, uh, probably there's not a program like that. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, again, not, not with an NHGRI that I can think of, but, sure. you know, no worries, does it mean? So, if I may ask, so what are some of the other programs for, you know, let's say, you know, PhD students or, you know, like postdocs that are kind of in the similar, uh, you know, framework, like data science plus genomics? So there, there is the, um, there is the, the T32 is for uh, PhD students, right? Um, um, to say, correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes I could be confused. Uh, but then there's also the earlier career or like for postdocs, there is the F 
99 or F um F to K99, right? F zero zero. Yeah, F F F ninety nine to K zero zero. I mean I I think there are there are quite a few um areas of of um training that we support. I was if you give me a second, I can share a screen with sort of a schematic of some of the funding opportunity announcements that we support by career stage. I'll 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 share that in just a second. Great, thank you. I just made you a co-host so that you can do that whenever you're ready. Um, but yeah, my my sense from looking at NIH um, solicitations over the past few years and talking with folks in the Office of Data Science uh, at the the, uh, the the overall institute level is that this is an area that that NIH does want to support more heavily uh, through each of the institutes, but also at the at the broad level too. All right, this is an interesting table. Tell yeah, okay, so I I can't possibly talk you through every single one of these, but um, for example, if we're talking about graduate students and pre-docs, if you look at this pink column here, we have a number of funding opportunity announcements. And the thing to note about NHGRI is data science is part of our mission. And so, you know, there are obviously um, program announcements like the one that Sandhya talked about that are specific for data science, but really anything that fits within the scope of NHGRI's mission, including data science, could be eligible for, like like Sandhya mentioned, the T32s. Um, we have individual awards to individuals um, at the at the fellowship level, either the you know, pre-doctoral or the pre-doc to postdoc transition. You know, we have lots of opportunities for postdocs, T32s, and then individual fellowships as well. So really, I don't want to say the sky's the limits, but as long as you're talking about genomic data science, chances are, you know, most of these institutional and individual training um, opportunities will, you know, meet, well, you know, you can, you can consider applying for any of them. Um, the R25 data scientist is the one that we're talking about here. So, you know, this is one, one line and several different opportunities. So, and I can um, send, I, I don't remember, Sandhya, did we put this as a backup in your slide deck? We can also send it out. Yeah, no, I have not, and I'll include this and send it on to John. Okay. So uh, I haven't uploaded it yet because the thank you. This is very helpful. Okay, and we do have. All, um, is it okay if I stop sharing so I can see you all again? And no. does anyone have any questions? Okay, I'll I'll put the link to our funding opportunity page, which I think um, Sandhya showed in her it's slides, in but yeah. it's in the power. Okay. It's in the PowerPoint. Great. So that, that actually has, so that's not as confusing as, as this colorful thing I showed it that has like a linear web page by career stage. So you can find them there too. And I think on the tight page, you have more focus just around the training diversity. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the, the subset that are specific for kind of more diversity focused um, right. funding opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. That's very helpful to know those that level of detail and see the big picture there because it, it may be the case that an institution would apply for, uh, you know, an R25 to supplement a T32 that they already have in a in a adjacent area or something. So, um, okay, we are getting close to the end of the hour here, and I see that our our attendees are dropping off. So I think we'll. We'll uh, end our, our discussion here. Um, really appreciate uh, both of you coming on the call today to talk more about the goals of the program. And, and we hope that we'll send some uh, future proposers your way and, and we can uh, continue to grow this workforce in the Midwest as well. Thank you. I was wondering if I could make a quick public service announcement. Of course. Um, so we are hearing from many of our grantees in the training space that they are concerned about the career opportunities and trajectories available to postdocs. And so um, NIH in general has published this request for information um, about the postdoc kind of career experience and opportunities. And if you all work with postdocs or have an opportunity to circulate this, we would really appreciate it. We, we really do want to listen to, especially the voices of trainees and some of the challenges they're facing because we're, we're aware that it's, you know, it's, it's a challenging thing for the entire research enterprise. So thank you so much for considering. Perfect. Yes, yeah. and you know, please share it broadly among your institutions too, because I think, yeah, you have a lot more communication network in that way than we do. Will do. Thank you both very much again. And uh, thanks to our audience for tuning in. We will see you next month. Thank you. We're glad to hear about your organization. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye.